So I got three papers. The speaker is Julian Buren, that's from the Faculty of Architecture at the Technical University of Lisbon. And its paper has the title of Semantic Structure of Domain of Formal Domains and Methods for the Development of Generic Grammars. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this, uh, this presentation is basically uh, fine tuning of, uh, of a lecture that I gave before. Uh, uh, the first time I gave this lecture was uh, at the Faculty of Architecture in Lisbon, and there was a reason, a specific reason for the uh, for doing this lecture. There were a, a lot of PhD students talking about generic grammars, and and of course all all the the subject was uh, related with the use of shape grammars and developing tools for. Uh, generic, the, the, for the development of generative systems, but they were all using the term uh, generic grammars in slightly different ways. So I thought it best to uh, bring forward some uh, concepts that could standardize, let's say, the use of, uh, of the term uh, generic grammar. So the presentation I'm going to give is actually a fine tuning of this presentation. It's a, more or less the fourth time that I do it. I, I published a very short paper in, in, in Portuguese in, in the Revista de Refugio Urbana. And this paper now here is, uh, is a, an extended version. I, I think it's probably the best on the topic until now. Uh, um, so the presentation basically uh, focuses on, on, on this. I'm going to talk about shape grammars, the uses of shape grammars, computational ontologies, design domains, and the shapes and concepts in design domains, basically classification of, uh, uh, of all concepts and shapes used in, in a design domain, the concept of design patterns, and to, to reach finally the, the, the concept of generic grammars. And then I will talk also about uh, information flow in, in design and there will be a discussion on how to develop, let's say, a generic grammar. But it, it, this was basically a lecture uh, 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 focusing on, on, on the students. So the first question uh, um, uh, would be, uh, what are shape grammars and what can we use them for? Um, so the, the, the concept was developed by uh, uh, George Stein and James Jeeps in, uh, in, in the beginning of the 70s. Uh, and basically, they, uh, shape grammars compute shapes recursively, uh, applying a, a, a shape transformation uh, uh, from an initial shape. Uh, so all uh, uh, shape grammars uh, have this generic form of A goes to B, uh, where A and B are shapes uh, um, in a design domain. Um, let me first give an idea what the design domain is. Uh, we could talk about urban design as a design domain. I will give a lot of examples related with urban design because that was the subject of my uh, PhD, uh, but we could talk about you know like things like chair design. Uh, there are some uh, you know, students at the faculty uh, who are working with, with chairs and trying to develop a tool for designing chairs. But it, the first thing, the first idea is to develop a kind of a generic grammar that can generate any chair. Um, so. Um, uh, as, a, as an example of uh, the uses of, uh, uh, um, of shape grammars, uh, we can see along all the literature that was produced on, on, on this topic, um, we have um, uses on analytical purposes, so basically for uh, understanding design styles, understanding uh, um, uh, morphology, so it can be used basically on morphological analysis but also for generative purposes. So basically, uh, uh, 
producing design syntheses or for the purpose of simulation. So some examples, the production of urban plans and their regulations, the simulation as a validation process or as a, a, a behavior forecast sometime. Uh, one classical example of, uh, of the use of uh, shape grammars in architecture is the example um, uh, of the prairie houses by uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, I usually uh, like to uh, show this information here, uh, hidden, because here you see that uh, this design by Frank Lloyd Wright, is, uh, it, it was used in, in, uh, as a, uh, one of the case studies that he uh, took from uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. Then um, the Roby House, and they developed the grammar that could generate this. But then these two last designs were generated by the grammar, uh, and this, uh, this house was developed uh, for Lionel March, and this one for uh, George Steiny, simply by applying the rules that were developed previously uh, by the researchers based on Frank Lloyd Wright. So these two houses were not designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, these two were designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. So these, these two were designed by the grammar. And these are other examples of uh, work following the same uh, principles. So uh, um, uh, a set of rules to generate uh, some design in a particular design style. Uh, so this was developed by two Italian uh, uh, PhD students that are working also uh, in Lisbon with us. And this is a, a, a grammar developed by Mario Kruger for the uh, uh, the, the plan of the sister saint uh, churches. Now, uses of shape grammars. Why do we need to use shape grammars in design? Uh, for what purpose? And is, it, is there any advantage relative to traditional methods? I usually ask this to the students every time they tell me they want to work with, with shape grammars. The first thing I ask, why shape grammars? Can you not do it with traditional methods? So uh, uh, what is the reason that uh, makes you use this? So uh, I would say that the best situation is whenever a design solution is best expressed through a design system rather than a single uh, design solution. And I can give you one simple ex example of a thing like this. You want to develop a housing system uh, for uh, a large uh, urban development and you want to have many possible solutions in terms of, uh, 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 let's say, possibilities of customization of the houses. So it's better to have a system rather than a single solution. And then you can customize solutions according to uh, some constraints that you can define. But first you need to have the language. So uh, the first thing you need to do when you want to develop a system like this is to understand the shape domain or the design domain where you're working. So if the example is housing, you need to understand what kinds of shapes you use uh, when you work with houses. If you want to work with the urban space, um, develop urban designs, you want to understand first the, the shapes that you deal with, with in urban design. So these are just a few examples. And typically a design domain is composed by other subdomains um, where some formal relationship can be established between uh, uh, those subdomains. Basically we're talking about uh, an ontology, the representation of uh, uh, that design domain through a formal ontology. So, Ontologies are computational representations of formal concepts and uh, basically it implies an explicit classification of all subclasses found in uh, that design domain um, and the explicit statement of formal relationships between subclasses. So basically in an ontology we have individuals which are instances 
Uh, we have classes, and the classes are basically a, a taxonomic structure of the, that uh, uh, design domain. Um, they have <coughs> attributes, meaning properties of each class of objects, of uh, each instance. And we should also establish the relationships between all these classes, define relationships in an explicit form. So basically, we define the topologic uh, structure of uh, the ontology. So this is uh, um, an example of a, a structure for uh, describing the urban uh, domain, the city, uh, which is basically uh, subdivided in, in, in representations of networks, of, uh, uh, of urban blocks, area zones, meaning property system, uh, landscape. Basically, I'm, I'm giving something more easy to understand here, cities uh, as a street system, the city as a book system, the city as a property system, the city as a, a natural uh, system, and the, system, uh, the city as a reference system. Uh, and there are other details of uh, uh, urban space that can be given related with activity, related with uh, materials, with uh, characterizations. So just to give you uh, uh, some details, I, I, I will go sorry, I will go in detail through uh, this network representation. So we have several classes here from uh, uh, axial network, transportation network, uh, street uh, nomenclature, street descriptions, and street components. I will show a little bit of that. So each uh, each class is dis uh, uh, described through the, all the possible instances, and relations are defined with other classes. And also, uh, um, in in the case of a, a, a type of street. So one particular instance of, uh, uh, of the class transportation network, we have certain descriptions uh, which basically define the kind of components that uh, 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 a street can be composed of. Also, um, street nomenclature takes uh, words that describe streets. This is language related. So it changes, this changes depending on uh, uh, the context that you're working on. Uh, so if it's an English uh, context, you use uh, English words. If it's Portuguese context, you use Portuguese words. And uh, um, the relations, again, between the name and the descriptions should be established. With, and later, the descriptions basically tell us about uh, the components of the street profile. And we have all the parameters, all the possible variations of all of this. So it's basically describing in detail all the components of the design domain. I gave you just a, 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 an overview of uh, one of the parts of this large ontology, which is describing this, the city. So um, we recur to generic grammar whenever the design object is uh, a particular design domain and we want to produce a grammar that generates uh, uh, instances within that design uh, domain. Again, as an example, the urban space, the building, chairs. So um, the more restrict and objective the design domain is, the simpler will be the implementation of a generic grammar. And basically, we need to define rules. And how can we let implement rules, and what are rules? So first, every rule, the most generic thing that we can talk about a rule is basically a predicate uh, condition uh, to some uh, uh, let's say, uh, um, predefined uh, um, con conceptualization of, uh, of an existing uh, uh, object, and then a transformation that transforms that object into 
consequent state. And this is the very abstract way of, uh, of putting this. So in any uh, uh, design domain, whenever the occurrence of an object set as, uh, uh, or, or set of objects A is found, you can apply a transformation to those objects producing a consequent B, such that B is a transformation of A. And um, uh, I, I can see that in the presentation there are some animations that are not working, so a few things that have not appeared. Anyway, uh, if anything really important uh, is needed, I will uh, give that information uh, in detail. Uh, this definition predicate goes to consequent. Uh, can be seen in, in different kinds of, uh, of theoretical uh, applications. For instance, in the case of the pattern language developed by Christopher Alexander, uh, you see the definition of uh, a pattern fits on that general definition of uh, uh, predicate goes to, uh, to consequent. Basically, uh, it's the identification of a recurrent problem in the urban environment for which there is a well-known and tested solution for, uh, 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 for that problem, which is applied as a consequence. Basically, that's what uh, 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 Christopher Alexander uh, applies. In the case of a shape grammar, uh, we have uh, uh, a shape, A, which is transformed in a shape, uh, uh, B. So for each occurrence, A, uh, A is subtracted from a shape uh, uh, C in such a way that uh, um, the, uh, the 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 shape um, uh, so it's uh, in a shape C. So the next step of this transformation is basically um, A subtracted from C and B added. Okay, which is a transformation. So what is the difference between shape grammars and uh, uh, patterns? The main difference occurs basically at the level uh, of the semantic structure and also on uh, pragmatics. Um, so uh, for instance, in the case of the pattern language, you have uh, ambiguity while reading the occurrences and you also have ambiguity while interpreting the transformation to apply. Uh, in the case of shape grammars, uh, occurrences are strict. Um, there are strict shape recognitions and, and they are deprived of meaning. It's a simple shape recognition and framework uh, and they occur only and only if the occurrence A or a parametric uh, 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 interpretation of A is found. So, what is the resemblance? Here, uh, uh, we don't see the uh, uh, we don't see the uh, the animation, but I will tell you. So, the resemblance is uh, basically we have uh, a similar uh, uh, algorithmic structure, uh, which is the important. Uh, 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 thing basically, and um, and that's what we want to uh, to use. Basically, combine the uh, this algorithmic structure that we have within patterns with the algorithmic structure of uh, of shape grammars. And the problems uh, the problem that was pointed related with shape grammars, the absence of semantics, uh, was addressed already many times uh, by trying to use other uh, extensions of shape grammars that could introduce semantics in, into their use. Basically, uh, the, actually the first uh, approach uh, to, uh, uh, to shape grammars was uh, to, let's say, production systems was uh, uh, through uh, the, the, the concept of production systems. Uh, that were developed by Post in, in, in the 
uh, in the 40s and later used by Chomsky for the, the development of, uh, of grammars for natural languages, which basically use uh, uh, text to, 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 to compute. Uh, Stein introduced also the concept of labels as uh, something that attaches some meaning uh, to, uh, to shapes. And labels were used basically in two ways, as classification uh, 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 labeling, but also as markers. And also introduced uh, later the concept of, this, of a description grammar, which basically introduces the set of conditions that allows uh, uh, um, uh, a shape grammar to be applied. It's basically a description of the result rather than uh, the des description of the, uh, of, the, of the rules. Also the concept of weights, uh, giving different weights to the representations, which allows to uh, <coughs> introduce another semantic level. And also uh, later Terenac introduced the concept of color grammars, which is another layer of, uh, uh, of semantics. <coughs> concept of, uh, uh, of shape grammars. So these are all forms of production systems that can, uh, uh, together with the computation of shapes, introduce semantics into the process. So basically, um, as I was saying, Chomsky computes with phonemes, uh, 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 also with labels or symbols, with formal descriptions of designs, with weighted shapes, and also colors. So um, this idea of design patterns um, uh, was uh, developed curiously uh, from, um, uh, from the, the, uh, the, the programming Computation uh, program uh, uh, researchers. They found out that uh, in, in pro developing a, com a computer program, people use often the same kinds uh, of algorithm. So he developed this concept of design patterns as, uh, let's say, template codes that are recurrently used in a, a computational program. And they developed the, the, the concept of uh, of a design pattern based on Christopher Alexander, but curiously, this expression design pattern was not developed by architects or designers at all. It was developed by uh, people in, in the uh, um, in informatics uh, um, science. Uh, so basically, the concept refers to recurrently used algorithms, and that is picking up all these concepts that I developed this idea uh, of, uh, uh, of developing design patterns for urban design. So I, I will tell the story very fast about two, uh, uh, two urban designers, Mr. Fritz and Mr. Rain. Uh, Mr. Fritz is Dutch and Mr. Rain is Portuguese and they're both urban designers and when they speak their own language they don't understand themselves. Okay. So they decided to uh, have speak in a common, common language um, and they chose English because they both <coughs> understand English. Uh, so Mr. Fritz tells uh, Mr. Rain that uh, he wants to show his plan and Interesting thing is that they share another uh, um, another language, let's say, the language of urban designers, and there should be a highlight here of the word plan. Okay, it's not. It was an animation. It's not showed though. But the uh, they share the word plan because it's a, 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 a word that has a particular meaning for them as uh, uh, as architects, as urban designers. So uh, Mr. Fritz starts explaining and he tells that, well, I first lay down the main axis passing, passing through a landmark. The axis is the longest meaningful line uh, in this site and it structures the territory. So all this slang 
is basically uh, uh, stuff that urban designers can understand. Okay, so they're using again what we could call, let's say, certain patterns. He continues the explanation. He says, "I use two orthogonal axes. One creates a visual alignment with an old tower, and the other connects with an old rural alley. Then I rotate it a little bit the axis to connect with the road. So." The animation is not working. It was basically showing all the information that was told. So basically, all those words, all that slang, uh, is about the use of design patterns, repeating the same uh, uh, actions of design. The, the reason why these two urban designers understand themselves is that they can uh, read um, um, this information and visualize something <coughs> out of the names of these elements. So we could have several kinds of words, radio grid, orthogonal grid, uh, others should appear here. They're not, the animations are doing that for <coughs> Okay, so then he continues, he explains that he applies a regular grid on top the axis. Now, the, this should be the result that you've seen before, and now there should be a regular grid on top of this, which is not showing up. So the question is, we always use the same design patterns? Do we always work in a similar fashion? And so Mr. Ryan asks that to Mr. Fritz, and Mr. Fritz uh, answers I always search for the longest meaningful line in the territory. So this, this sentence was spoken to me by Fritz Palmo, uh, who was explaining uh, one of his designs, and he said this uh, um, at a certain point in his explanation. And then he picked up a, a book, and, uh, and he showed me several plans that he developed where he applied this same principle. Uh, finding the longest meaningful line in the territory. So this was the, the first rule that he applied uh, uh, in his designs. And that's the, 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 the moment where I came up. And basically, uh, my propos uh, proposal is that these, uh, these design moves, these design actions could be, uh, uh, could be uh, encoded into a, uh, an algorithm, algorithm that could be programmed and uh, basically um, in my thesis I call them uh, urban induction patterns and, uh, and they can be combined to produce uh, a design. These are the names of several of these algorithms and if you read them with attention you can see that uh, they have some meaning we can imagine a, a design operation out of this. And so this is basically what we need to do when we work in a design domain. We need to identify what are the typical actions we do uh, while designing and then encode them uh, uh, using the objects that we have, which are defined, sorry, which are defined in several classes uh, and make rules to uh, produce uh, uh, results, transformations. Make some of this. So basically, I picked up the two concepts, of patterns and grammars. And the idea was to uh, have a general uh, definition uh, of a design operation and then encode that design operation with a shape grammar. And to do that, I would identify the structure uh, uh, of the grammar, the rules of the grammar, uh, the kind of objects that uh, the grammar uses, uh, formally uh, represent them as, as a shape grammar. You can see all this information in uh, um, in, the, uh, in my thesis, you can download it from uh, the Tugelf repository or DSEP website. 
the publication website. Sorry about this. So this is uh, an example of the application of, uh, of the rules that we've seen before. And again, until you get uh, one design. And here, a lot, of, uh, a lot of rules are applied more or less simultaneously. You can see this also in detail in this paper uh, that uh, was published in the uh, Planet. So the big question, how should we develop a generic grammar? So a set of rules for that. Uh, define the design domain. Define all the elements and classes in the design domain, giving explicit relationships between classes and uh, uh, explicit definitions of individuals and their attributes. Uh, define the patterns, as Alexander would do. Uh, making them uh, understandable, verbally and systematically. Uh, then define the rules that formally define the transformations that are implicit in the patterns description, meaning the implementation of, uh, uh, let's say, several grammars which correspond to each pattern. And then introduce the generic grammar into an implementation system. Um, so basically, the idea is to develop meta-languages for uh, design uh, spaces. I'm going faster through this. Methodological issues. Uh, to start with, you should select a representative set uh, of case studies within a design domain that you want to work. Infer grammars that can generate objects within that uh, design domain, producing specific grammars. Uh, uh, which can make you understand the design domain and how grammars work, then collect the technical information needed to evaluate those elements uh, and the uh, domain of objects that you're working with. Understand what are the parameters that are responsible for the qualities of learning them, because understanding what are those parameters allows you to uh, introduce some intelligence in the system. Uh, and then, uh, depending on, on that, you can improve the, the grammar so that you can produce better results than the ones that were taken from your uh, examples. You test the new grammar to evaluate uh, uh, results, then define the grammar in, into general design procedures, so all the patterns that you need uh, uh, to use for uh, common studied um, uh, the grammars. And, uh, and always focusing on, on, on the main goal of, uh, of the design. So then we get uh, generic grammar. Uh, I will skip this. This is the formal definition of, uh, of the uh, generic grammar. You can read it in detail on the paper uh, with um, how the, the grammars can be combined in terms of the combination of uh, algebras. Uh, again, the formal details of the definition and how they relate to the ontology, basically, because we're talking about parallel grammars, which take objects from different classes and they work 
So the main uh, important thing is that uh, uh, we take elements from existing situations in the, in the case of uh, urban design, which represent the initial shapes of the process, and then we apply rules to, to this uh, structure. And rules can be very simple. They can uh, play with, they can transform shapes and attributes of the shapes. And so basically you can have a representation of a building, several attributes of them. We have different data types and we can have rules like this which actually transform a representation into another. And in methodological terms it actually happens that we start from case studies which, for which we develop uh, specific grammars, then we develop generic grammars, and from the generic grammars we can develop new designs which actually correspond to new specific grammars. Uh, next. So, the second speaker is Gabriel Varela.